Right, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan van der Walt. I'm a postdoc here at Berkeley. I'm from uh, a small town called Stellenbosch down in South Africa. Um, yeah, the southern tip of Africa. Um, I, I came by electronics engineering, ended up in applied maths, and my main interest is currently image processing. And uh, I'm also a uh, lead author on Scikit's image, uh, which I'll be telling you a bit about today. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the layout of image processing packages in, in, uh, in Python, um, you are all very familiar with NumPy by now. Uh, NumPy is based on, uh, on C source code. Um, it calls into some linear algebra libraries, um, and there's also some Cython involved. And on top of NumPy, you then have the extended scientific uh, routines. And inside of SciPy, there's a package called ndImage. And ndImage uh, is used for dealing with n-dimensional image data sets. Uh, Matplotlib is often used to visualize those images. Those images are just matrices. Uh, gray level images, we, t we typically just have an M by N image. Uh, when you start working with color images, you typically have several layers. So it's N, M by N by 3 for RGB, or 4 if you have an alpha layer as well. Um, yeah, and we use Matplotlib to visualize those typically. So ND image comes from the astronomy community. It was uh, originally a part of, it was written by Peter Verfeer as part of uh, NumArray, um, which, so, so NumPy originated as two parts, NumArray and Numeric, and those were blended together in the end. And uh, when they came together, there wasn't really room for in the image, so in the image ended up inside of SciPy. Uh, but then, uh, in the image, unfortunately, is written in, in C, so it's fairly hard to maintain. Uh, we didn't have a, a lot of contributors there, so we decided to start a new project uh, called Scikit's image. Uh, all the toolboxes for, for SciPy are called uh, Scikit's. Uh, so there are several out there, and I think you'll learn today about Scikit-learn, Scikit's uh, image. Um, there's stats models for fitting linear models and so forth. So a whole bunch of them, basically like the toolboxes inside of MATLAB. So we started Scikit's image, um, and we do not deal with n-dimensional data sets mostly. We just deal with uh, image processing algorithms on you know, single layer images. Um, but we try and write uh, the kind of code that's very easy to maintain. And we go for slightly more complex algorithms that you can't easily implement inside of C. Um, all right, so let me just show you the, these slides should be available. Um, We're trying to get them up now. Right, so. Uh, this gives you an idea of the types of things implemented inside of uh, SciPy's ND image. Uh, you've got things like convolution, uh, when you want to blur an image or sharpen an image, uh, correlations, when you want to fit a mask, you know, locate an object inside an image, uh, Gaussian filters for uh, blurring again, uh, sharpening. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Fourier filters. Interpolation, uh, this module is when you want to do geometric transformations of your images, like rotation, scaling, uh, et cetera. Um, methods for measuring objects inside of an image. So for example, if you want to count the number of, of stars in a frame or something like that, you'd identify all the different objects and use some of these methods to compute statistics on them. Um, some morphology, so there's gray level and black and white morphology. Morphology is typically used for manipulating the structure inside of an image. So for example, if you have a piece of text and you want to do text recognition on it, uh, if you convert that uh, text to black and white before you uh, do the text recognition, you may find that a lot of text has got like little lines sticking out of it, it's not very smooth, etc. Then you typically use uh, morphology operations. Um, it's it's a group operations. They will they will do something like say, hey, let's uh, let's look at this group of pixels. If um, if there's a little straggler sticking out, cut it off. So it manipulates the structure of the image in that way. Um, so you may get um, in that scenario, you may, you may get much smoother text out. All right. Are you using the new, new, new version of 
I'm using the new, new, new version of Notebook, yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. The um. Okay. Yeah. The the examples for today in the breakout session you can all do using only ND image. You don't even need Scikit's image, so it should be fine. Um. Right, so I thought I'd start you off by taking a, a typical image processing problem that you might run into an industry um, and show you how we'd use these tools to uh, solve that problem. So the example here is one where you've got an image obtained uh, by scanning element microscopy um, and it shows a sample taken on glass. Here's the sample. Uh, there's some grains of sand on there. Uh, so you'll see different, different colors here. So the, the gray background is the glass itself. And then uh, what are the different patches? So some bubbles, black, unmolten sand grays. Those are the dark gray blobs. Um, and we'd like to know which fraction of the sample is covered by each of these three phases, the molten ones, the sand grains, and the background. So, um, yeah, so we're going to see how, how can we count that automatically using in the image. So, first thing we need to do is to get the image into Python so we can manipulate it. So, we're going to start by importing matplotlib um, numpy, and then we're just going to read the image using matplotlib. There's a small little bug in matplotlib at the moment which flips uh, some PNG images or some JPEG images up and, uh, upside down. So um, you do uh, imread to get hold of the image, and then until they fix the bug, you just have to flip it upside down. Uh, and here I show it. Uh, you'll notice that I use, uh, I specify the color map as gray. Otherwise, the image appears in all sorts of funky colors. And we use nearest interpolation. So when you display an image using matplotlib, you can tell it which kind of interpolation to use. Um, when you do image processing, it's often handy to use nearest interpolation because that won't hide any artifacts. You see each pixel that is inside of that matrix or inside the image. Uh, whereas if you use something like cubic interpolation, bilinear interpolation, it might hide some of the detail going on. Right, so next step is to get rid of uh, the black banner. You'll see there's a the microscope added something there at the bottom. So we just want to get rid of that. So I take the first 880 rows of the image um, and drop the rest of them. So just using a bit of uh, indexing there to get rid of those. Okay, so there we've got the image without the banner. Now, if you look at this image, you'll see there's a lot of speckles. I don't know if you can see it from way back there, but there's like a whole bunch of speckles all around. Uh, and we presume that those are noise. We're not really interested in counting those. So let's just get rid of them. Now, uh, I just described briefly uh, morphology to you. So uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, any morphological operations? Uh, do you know convolution? You do? A little bit? OK. So the concept. Let me just interrupt for a second. Hmm. So if you go under resources lectures, there's a PDF version of, of these slides. And if you have a notebook open, uh, if, if you can get an image like this, um, we'll also post all that stuff too in just a bit. Uh, you can just cut and paste. But if the notebook that, that we have, Thank you. All right, so um, you start off by defining what they call a structuring element. So in this case, we may choose to use a little star or you know a little cross. And you move this little cross over your image. And you say, um, unless this star is completely covered 
uh, by a pixel, remove that pixel from the image. So you can see that in most parts of the image, um, that would be fine, except like when you end up in a place like this, where it's basically black with just a single pixel on the inside, it's going to throw it away because it doesn't, the whole of the cross isn't covered by, by color. And when you do that, um, so there's the code for that. Um, we use ND Images Median Filter. Um, there are plenty of other ways to filter those out. Um, and when you apply the median filter, you see that all the, all the speckles have gone. Um, right, so the median filter works slightly different than the morphological operations, uh, but there are numerous different ways that you can uh, get rid of noise like that. Um, the idea is just to, to make the image, pre-process the image, so it is more suitable for what we want to do next. And the next step is actually the interesting part. How are we going to uh, isolate the three different layers of this image, essentially? How are we going to split up the light background of the glass versus the black blobs versus the sand grains? So to see how we're going to do that, I, did a, I plotted a histogram of the image. So just using matplotlib's histogram command. Uh, and what do we see here? We see that the image, the intensities here at the bottom uh, are very clearly grouped in three. So we've got a spike here around intensity zero, which is black. Those are the big black blobs. Then here around 100, which is the light gray. And again, uh, no, that's the dark gray. And around 140, uh, that's the gray background. So where do you think we can cut off this image, what would be good thresholds to use there? Anyone like to volunteer a threshold? So say I want to just separate this one out. Then, yep, 1040, you know, we just have to basically say, just ignore all the values higher than 40 intensity and just look at these. Uh, for this guy, we're going to have to set two thresholds to get it out. So we want to say between 60 and 120, and then we can look 120 and up. So let's see what happens when we do that. You can also put a mixture model. Yeah, you could. <laughs> um, right, so that's exactly what I did here. I said uh, the bubbles, uh, that part of the image is simply the median filtered image where it has intensity less than or equal to 50. Sand is between 50 and 120, and glass is greater than 120. So uh, just based on what you know of NumPy already, do you know what data type I'm going to get out from this first line over here? So if I do image median less or equal to 50, what, am I gonna, what, what comes out of that, that operation? An array of? Yeah, absolutely. So this is basically a truth test. Um, is the image intensity less or equal than 50? So I'm, I'm going to get an array out with the same dimensions as uh, image median, but it's going to only have true false values in it. So it's a mask, right? So I've got my three masks for the different phases, and then I'm just going to plot each of those in a different subplot. So there's just a little utility function that takes the original, the bubbles, the sand, the glass, and it plots them. So let me do that. There we go. So here you see the original image. The big black blobs have been isolated. The sand grains have been isolated. And the rest is just the, the light background. All right. So I want to visualize all of these inside of one image. So I basically want to colorize the whole thing. So how can I do that? Well, I can construct. Um, Using np.zeros, I can construct a new image. It has to have the same dimensions as my input image, except it now has to have three layers, because I want red, green, and blue. So I use np.zeros with the same shape as my input image, but with the three layers. And then I proceed to assign, using these masks that I just created for the bubbles, the sand, the glass, different values. So I assign 1, 0, 0 to the bubbles. So red, green, blue. 1 for red, 0 for green, 0 for blue. So that's going to be red. Um, sand gets full red and full green. So there we get yellow. And 
the glass is 001, so that's just blue. And when we've uh, constructed that array and we plot it, this is what we see. So very nice representation of those three layers together. Except, um, do you see what goes on around the fringes here? We've still got, like, on the red blobs, we've still got a little bit of yellow surrounding it. Um, so we want to get rid of that as well. So we're just going to do uh, one more step of processing using, again, a little bit of morphology. Uh, in this case, we're going to make use of um, a binary opening and closing, which does exactly what I described here, basically, just to get rid of those. And when you call that operation, um, it cleans up the boundaries very nicely so you don't have those little <laughs> speckles on the side. All right, so now we're in a good position to start counting these different objects that we found. So we, uh, we're going to label the different components and count their sizes. So uh, first we convert bubbles, sand, and glass, those masks of ours. We convert them into integers because we don't want them to be true and false any longer. We now want to, uh, for the different grains of sand, we want to give each grain of sand a number, basically. And to do that, we use ndimage.label. So ndimage.label, um, and there's an equivalent function in scikit's image, uh, it goes and it runs across the image and it basically finds connected components. So if you've got loose grains of sand, each grain will be labeled uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, etc. So we call ndi.label on each of our images. Um, and then we use this single line of list comprehension to count the total size of those images in the image, uh, of those uh, objects in the image. We say um, wherever the image is equal to i, uh, you know, sum the number, just count the number of occurrences, and do that for all the different labels we found. Uh, and if you run that, then you get output like this. So in the sand, it found 115 uh, separate regions. In total, uh, the, the mean object area, at least, was 1,769 pixels, uh, 70 regions for the bubbles, 27 for the glass. And if we plot those labeled images, you can now very clearly see what happened. I plotted them with... Um, what was the color map? Spectral here, which is a useful color map because it changes very rapidly. So you can see how numbers increase. So this bubbles example is very nice. You can see like it starts off purple, then blue, green, red. That's how ND image went through and basically labeled each of these individual components separately. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this basically solves the, the problem. And that is a, that's a very typical image processing pipeline that you would, you would see in industry. Um, yeah? If you had an image that had multiple bands, would you just run this for each band? Or like how would you explain it? Right, so uh, the question is if you have an image with different bands, uh, how would you approach this? Uh, most algorithms in image processing are just geared to one layer. So people typically convert down the image uh, or they move into a different color space. Um, are you familiar with, uh, with the HSV color space at all? Uh, so normally we describe an image in terms of red, green, and blue components, like what you would on a, on a TV screen. You know, you'd have like the old, I don't know how the modern TV screens work, but the old ones at least had like three elements, red, green, and blue. And depending on which ones you fire, you get a different color back. Um, but the human, the human brain has got a very different way of seeing the world. We don't see the world in terms of red, green, and blue. Um, we, I mean, our senses are red, green, and blue, but if we talk about perception, what do you see? You see, uh, if you have to describe uh, the color of his jersey, you might say, well, it's orangey or red. It's kind of not very bright. Um, you know, you, you would use terms like that. And that is pretty much what the uh, HSV color space tries to embody. So HSV stands for U, saturation, and value. So U is the color. So that would be like red or blue or green. Uh, saturation is how full is that color? You know, is it like gray or is it like a bright, bright red, for example? And then the value is just like the intensity. Is it dark or is it very bright? So often we convert images into that color space and then we can um, manipulate them in a way that's much more natural for human beings. Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, we typically, unless you've got a vector approach, you have to convert the image to a single layer and process it. Are there any other questions about the example or anything you've seen so far? Okay. All right, so that was just a brief uh, tour of ND image. And now I'll proceed to tell you a little bit about Scikit's image, uh, the project that we're currently building. Uh, I'm not sure which version you guys have installed. 0.4 was the last release. A uh, whole lot happened since the 0.4 release, so we're currently almost at the point where we're going to re uh, release 0.5. Um, so some of these examples uh, may not yet work on 0.4. All right, so let's go to... There we go. So there's the Scikit's image homepage. Um, so it's a library that's free of charge, free of restriction, and we really try to write high co quality code, and it's very much a, a community effort. And if you guys end up using this for some reason, uh, we very much appreciate feedback, bug reports, and of course, code contributions. Um, we, uh, on, if you go to the front page, you'll see links to the documentation, how to download it, etc. But one of the interesting places to go, if you scroll down, is to the gallery. And in the gallery, we give examples of some of the main functionality. So it's very much like the matplotlib gallery that you've seen before, except that we've got a whole bunch of uh, image processing examples. And I'll run through those um, just now. So the reason we started this project was because a lot of things that could be really easy were kind of hard using uh, pure SciPy, matplotlib, and so forth. You could like build the whole tool uh, the whole pipeline, but you often had to uh, go to more effort than you wanted to. So we wanted things to be really simple. So um, if you say uh, if you want to uh, display an image or process an image, um, you'd start with from SK image, like it's image import. Um, I.O., that's for displaying images, data, if you want to get hold of some test data sets. And in this example, I'm going to show uh, the filter module, just to show you how these things string together. So you typically, you want to start off, uh, grab some data set. So I say image is data.coins. Coins is just a, an example data set we provide. Uh, do some filtering operation, like get the Sobel filter uh, and apply it to the image, and then uh, display the image. And there's your result. So do you, have, really do you have an argument about using filter as one of your modules? Yeah, I saw it was highlighted. It's in a it's built in. Word, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could do from SK image import filter as yeah, felt. felt. <laughs> yeah. Um, you just created a name space concept. Yeah, I know. So the image returned here is just a normal array, and there's no reason why you, why you have to use our input-output. In fact, our input-output just uses matplotlib at the back end. Uh, we've got several plugins, so you can either use matplotlib, we've got, um, we can use Qt to display an image, we can use, you yeah. know, there's, there are numerous output backends. Matplotlib's the default one. Um, so. so you could just as well have used this command. So io.imshow is exactly equivalent to plot imshow with uh, the color map set to gray and interpolation set to nearest. Same thing. Right, so. So just to go into a little bit more detail about the input output module, um, you saw earlier on that matplotlib had that little bug where it flipped the image upside down. So you might not want to use matplotlib to uh, read an image. So you could say, for example, uh, to the input-output module, use the plugin pull instead of matplotlib to uh, do image reads. And then when you read the image, you'll see it was not flipped upside down. So um, we just chose to use uh, the Python imaging library instead of matplotlib to read it. Um, the reason we did this is because it becomes very easy to write your code in a, in a modular sort of uh, way where you can say, well, uh, let's use matplotlib today. Tomorrow you might change your mind, decide you want to use uh, different modules to load it, and you can easily swap between the different ones. Um, one that's a little bit more fun is our Qt image viewer. Uh, so when you 
use the plugin Qt for image showing, and you provide the fancy equal true argument. Um, then the scikit's image uh, viewer pops up, and this is, a, this is a nice way of inspecting images. As you move the cursor over the image, you'll see the red, green, blue, HSV, uh, and the position of your cursor changing. Uh, you can adjust the image to play around with different uh, color adjustments. You could, um, you know, you could manipulate the brightness contrast. So almost an image editing kind of approach. You're just playing around with parameters, seeing what works. And once you're done, let's say you wanted to adjust the gamma of this image, so you want to push it up to, now that looks horrible. Let's try, um, let's change the U. No, let's change, let's just make this image really green. There we go. Oh, it's additive. That explains. OK. There we go. So now we've got a very nice green cameraman. Let's reduce the red. OK. Um, and then you'll see you can either save the image to file now. Um, you can also commit the changes you made. So you can basically build up a number of changes, put them on top of one another, um, revert them if you're unhappy. Uh, but this one is fun. We'll save it to the stack. So if we click on Save to Stack, the image gets popped onto a stack. And they tell us, if you want to get hold of that image, call io.pop. So we're going to go back to our, I'm going to close this. And I'm going to go back here to there. And then if I call pop, I just get that image back. And I can continue manipulating it. Um, you guys may, from time to time, have the need to load FITS images. So one of our backends we provide is for reading FITS files. So if you do io.use plugin uh, FITS, then it makes use of PyFITS in the background. So unless you have PyFITS installed, that won't work. Um, and then, yeah, it reads the it reads FIT, FITS file, uh, files from disk. Um, some of these images are required in the breakout session, but I did convert them to PNG for you. So if you don't have PyFITS, you can access them easily. Right, so, so when manipulating images, the data type of the image is, is rather important. Um, common ways of representing an image would be to use a floating point format. If you use f uh, floating point values, they typically put images between 0 and 1. So all your values, the, the black would be 0 and white would be 1. Uh, another common convention is to use uh, unsigned um, 8-bit integers. So those are integers that run from 0 to 255. Um, and then more recently, since we now have ample storage space, people store uh, images as 16-bit you know, integers, which run from 0 to uh, 65535, et cetera. Um, so here's an example of the kind of problem you may run into. Uh, that image I just loaded using PyFITS, uh, its data type is float32, but if you look at it, its minimum and maximum values, uh, they run from 100 to 65,000 something. So, uh, Saigit's image wouldn't know what to do with that image because the, ran the range of the values are all messed up. For floating point values, we expect them to lie between, uh, the values to lie between 0 and 1. So, if you try and operate on that image, like for example, doing that Sobel filter again, uh, you're going to get an error and it's going to tell you uh, images of type float must be between 0 and 1. So, we have numerous utility functions for dealing with that situation. Uh, I import the exposure module from SK image, and I say, please rescale the intensity of this image. So that basically just takes the image, it takes the minimum value, moves it to zero, it takes the maximum value, moves it to one, and then your image covers uh, the, whole, the whole span. And when you operate on that image, uh, everything will work fine. Uh, you can also, when you do that rescaling of the intensity, you can tell it, 
what the input range should be. So I took that floating point image and said, uh, let's assume that, point, that 0 is my black value, but 0.25 is my white value. So uh, that basically discards all the values above 0.25 and stretches the image so that 0.25 is now my new uh, white value. And then, uh, so that's a, that's a good way of when you're plotting images, for example, uh, like if you do the Fourier transform of a signal, uh, you very often find that the whole spectrum is basically very low in amplitude, except right at the origin, like the mean is super high. So you've got like this low, low amplitude except for this one position. So there typically you want to cut off that one value and stretch the rest of them. So there you'd use something like the input range and, and limit it. Uh, to further deal with the different kinds of, of images, we've got these utility functions. So you can say, give me my image as a float, as an int, as an unsigned byte. And that just converts between the different representations. So if you use the uh, image as float, you'll get an image between 0 and 1. Uh, as int, it will be between 0 and 255. Um, uh, sorry, int is... Uh, 32767, that's a 16-bit integer, and unsigned byte is between 0 and 255. Uh, Psychic's image will also warn you if you're doing something that, that might lead to trouble. So you'll see that uh, there's a possible precision, precision loss when converting from floating point representation to integer representation. You can think if your, va if your image values lie between 0 and 1, but you've got floating point values, you can basically have uh, a whole wide variety of values, whereas if you use unsigned bytes to represent, you can only have 255 different values. So you run a risk of throwing away some of your data. All right, well, if, uh, we've got numerous uh, test data sets because often you just quickly want to try out a little algorithm. You don't want to load data from disk. So if you import the data module, you could use data.camera, for example, to get hold of this guy, data.coins. Um, gives you these and if you do the question mark behind a data set you get a little description of what it is so, uh, what did I do oh I'm still using the fits plugin that won't work fits plugin can't use uh, can't load PNGs okay so there there you see uh, those are Greek coins from uh, Pompeii and gives a little bit of background about what you see in the image, what the image is typically used for or useful for illustrating and where you can get hold of the original data and what the copyright restrictions would be if you decide to use in a paper, etc. Uh, so there is a small version of the tarball now. Yeah. You, you already have that. Yeah, they're shipped with the uh, distribution. Um, right, so the idea is that any single uh, function inside of Scikit's image can take any, input, any image as input. Uh, so you can, whether you use floating point representation, integer, you just pass them into the function, and the function will do what it needs to do, and it will pass out an image of whichever type it finds convenient. So you can easily string functions together. Like uh, I took the, the cameraman image, uh, applied the canny filter to it, and here's what you see as the output. But you could just as well string a couple of things together. So from the filter module, I did total variation denoising, and then applied the canny filter to it, and you see you get a much cleaner function, uh, a much cleaner image out. Uh, but you can string arbitrary functions together like that, basically build yourself a nice long pipeline, and um, yeah, it's as simple as that. I have an example here about color spaces. Uh, maybe I'll skip that one for now. So here's an example where we are going to uh, take an image and scale it up or down. Often when you start off with an image, that image, especially in the field you're in, you have these extremely large images. 
So while you're developing an algorithm, you typically want to scale that image down before you start, you know, just to, to test your ideas out on. Um, so ND image has got a method called zoom. And if you specify, uh, I take the data, the cameraman image, I use ND image zoom on it with a zoom factor of 0.1. So scaling it down by 10, essentially. And when I do that, uh, this is the output I get. So you can see that this is a much lower resolution version of my input. Um, Sigus image allows you to do something a little bit fancier if you want. Um, it's got this idea of a homography, which is basically just a coordinate transformation. So uh, you can specify a 3x3 three three matrix, and each coordinate in the image is represented as a vector of x, y, z, and that vector is uh, multiplied with this matrix to find its new output position. So uh, this is a, you'll recognize some things in here. This is, a, if you did a linear algebra course, you would see that um, I've got a cosine term, a minus sign, a sine, and a cosine. So that's a rotation matrix. Um, then here I've got translation in the x and y direction, and the two little coefficients here just adjust uh, skew. So if I just want to zoom in and out, like I did earlier on, um, I just manipulate this s parameter here. So uh, you can see if, um, if you take, where can I write? So if you have your image coordinates x, y, and 1, and you multiply with a matrix of this form, 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.1. Um, then you see what happens there. You take your new x value. So your new x value is just 0 0.1 what x used to be. Your new y value is 0 0.1 of what y used to be. And the z coordinate remains the same. Or, yeah. So. Uh, that's just another way of scaling the image. So if I set s equal to 0.1, um, I use this matrix, I apply it, you get exactly the same as what we did with the zoom command in ND image. Uh, but we do have a little bit more flexibility now because we can adjust this matrix to include, for example, uh, a rotation angle. So let's uh, set that angle to 10 degrees, for example. And there you see the image is is rotated by 10 degrees. Uh, if you want to translate the image as well, you can set those uh, parameters there, translate x and y. So there you see the image is rotated, shifted. Um, and the skew parameters, the person has to be a bit careful. They're very sensitive. Uh, well, not that sensitive. OK, let's see. Yeah. Uh, let's not do the scaling because that looks a bit funny. Oh. Uh, so I guess I need to do that. Yeah, so there you see a little bit of rotation, translation, and skewed. Um, so this, this kind of comes in handy in all sorts of different places, but let me show you an example from computer vision. Uh, no, I so let me. So I just used the first 50 by 50 pixels. This is actually the output, but you see, like there is the part that we're interested in, yeah. because I scaled it down so much. If I um, if I change the scaling parameter to one, then yeah, it's a nice high resolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, these two parameters here tweak those z values. Um, yeah, so I'll show you an example of where I use that. Uh, I included this uh, Python file for you as well if you want to play with unwarp.py. Um, there we go. So. Here you start off with a warped version of the camera, and you can specify where do you want to warp that image to, anywhere, anywhere on this thing. So you can click 
for example, there, 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 and there. And then you also have to click the corresponding points in this image over here. So I'll say, well, those corner points lie there, 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 and there. And then it maps it out for you. So um, let me do another example. So you see, um, so let's, uh, let's just map this version out to a, to a rectangular shape. So I'll click in the, in the center of each corner, there and there. And if you click on the corners, there we go. So sometimes you have uh, an image, like if you have, for example, two star fields and they're kind of almost closely aligned, but there's a little bit of a, a, a linear distortion between the two. Uh, if you can map, match four stars on each of the images, uh, then you can use this to, you know, to uh, transform the images so they lie right on top of one another. Um, so this is, this is all linear transformation. You'll see like all straight lines were preserved. No matter what we did here, a straight line rem remained a straight line. Even in, in this example here, uh, straight lines here remain straight lines over there. But any image allows you to do any kind of crazy transformation. So, um, so here we've got an example where we've got extreme radial distortion. Uh, some... Some camera lenses just uh, warp straight lines quite a lot, and this is not really what we want to see. So what this example allows me to do is I can, I've got a little cursor, and I can mark three points on a straight line. So there, there, and there. And then let me take this line over here, this one. This one and this one. And there we go. So there's the original. And then you can do some nonlinear warp to, and now you see all the lines are, are very nice and straight. Um, yeah, so any image allows you to do all sorts of crazy transformations like that. Uh, so this radio is no, no, this is, I, I put the script in there, but this is just something I wrote. Uh, but it makes use of, um, so there's the main function that it uses. It's called um, in the image .map coordinates. And it's got a bit of a crazy syntax because you basically have to map all the coordinates beforehand to where you want them to go and then just send them in. Uh, but then it's, it's pretty powerful. So I'll show you one more example of that. So here's a short little paper that we submitted a while ago and there was, um, we made use of something called the log polar transform. Have any of you ever run across the log polar transform? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, image uh, warp. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so what you do is you basically rewrite the image in terms of polar coordinates. So uh, here you've got the x-axis and the y-axis, but on the transformed image, you've got distance from the center versus angle. So you'll start a pixel like that, for example. You'd measure the angle, 45 degrees, find 45 degrees on this axis, and then find the distance from the center uh, and plot it. Except we do something else as well. We don't only take the distance, but we take the log of the distance. Uh, so why would you do that? That seems kind of like a crazy thing to do. Uh, well, the reason is because uh, what happens to multiplication in when you take the log of multiplication? becomes addition essentially, right? So what happens is if you zoom this image in and out, so if you scale it, zoom in on it, scale it up or down, uh, then that basically just becomes a translation in this domain. If you rotate this image, so if an angle here changes, it becomes a translation up or down. So zoom, translation in the x direction, 
uh, rotation becomes translation in the y direction. So this is super handy when you do image registration, for example. Um, instead of having to try and estimate uh, zooms and uh, rotations, you just have to do a correlation in this domain. And uh, those things come out for free. Um, okay. So part of the homework today um, requires determining features in an image. So here's a short little example from uh, Scikit's image that uses histogram of gradients. So it splits up the image into a whole bunch of uh, blocks, and then for each block, it counts the different uh, gradient orientations that it sees. Um, so from Scikit's image.feature, import histogram of gradients, and just call that, tell it how many orientations you want to count, how many pixels per cell, because it's going to chop up the image in little blocks. Uh, so you tell it how many pixels for each uh, block, and <laughs> it's not just the southern hemisphere, it's uh, everywhere the Brits went. <laughs> oh, wasn't, it, wasn't there a war or something? <laughs> well, I feel a little bit threatened now. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so, uh, Right, and again, I used, uh, here I used that rescale intensity function that I showed you earlier on because the histogram is typically, like if you have, um, uh, you know, like five different orientations, the peak values may be like at 0 0.3 or whatever. Um, so I just uh, scaled that image so that it appears nice and white on the display. So cameraman and the histogram of gradients, which is basically at each position, we plot a little line and the intensity of the line varies depending on the directions that were found. So you'll see um, around, so here around the camera leg, it found those angles were quite prevalent. Those should be perpendicular to, hmm, I'm not sure why they lie like that. Might be the discretization. Um, yeah, and over here where things are fairly vertical, you see like the horizontal gradient coming out quite strongly. So uh, you may be interested in looking at these for the classification task. All right, last thing I'll do is just uh, run through a couple of... Sorry, how is it represented in each pixel? So the gradient apparently has an angle and an intensity? Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure how, they weigh the, how we weigh the intensity. Um, I'll have to look at the algorithm. I, I can't remember. That's for color? That's for gray level images. Yeah, but you can split an image into the R, the G, and the B and do it on each of those um, and add them together, whatever you wish to do. Um, most often we just convert. There's, so there's a whole color space module. Uh, let me show you. So, so if you do from SK image import color, then you get access to color.rgb to gray, which takes a color image and, and tra uh, transforms it into a gray level image. There's also gray to RGB if you want to take a gray image and take it to the color domain. But of course, all that does is basically duplicate the gray level because we can't infer the colors from nothing. Um, well, <laughs> well, you can. You can if you, if you train a classifier before and something like that. But, um, all right, so I'm just going to show you a couple of final examples. So. Have you heard of uh, seam carving? So, so often you have an image and you want to rescale that image, but it's kind of annoying if you uh, have, for example, you have a photo of the beach with a bunch of people running on the beach, uh, but now you want to fit that photo into a column this wide. So if you scale the image, if you flatten it this way, then all the people become like super thin. Um, and that's not really ideal. So here you see the same sort of thing. You've got, you've got an image. If you scale it down, everything's too small. If you crop it, then you can't get all the objects of interest in the image. So what you typically really want to do is something like this. 
I mean, it's cheating a little bit, but... <laughs> what? Isn't that lying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so that's what seam carving is all about. It's like it's trying to find a way of representing all the information in the image without actually um, preserving everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know. Sometimes you need to put the picture in and it won't go, so. You can see it doesn't look good when you squish it. <laughs> you should never trust what you see in digital images. So here they show uh, what's happening, or they will soon. Yeah, so, so this is what we do. We, we take the image, we find all the edges in the image. You can do that with something like uh, the skimage.filter.sobel or canny, any of those will give you the edges in the image. And now we want to remove pixels from the image, but which ones are good to remove? So do you, are your eyes, uh, do they see the edges or the smooth areas better? Like, what would you pick up on if I took it away? I think if you, t if you take the edges away, your eyes are going to tell like, whoa, there's something weird going on. But if I just sort of run through here, you know, in the smooth areas and just like surreptitiously remove those pixels, I mean, no one needs to be any the wiser. Um, so we've got this algorithm called the shortest path. It's the same as dynamic programming. Uh, you take that edge image and you try and find the shortest path through the image, the, the, imi the path with the least changes in it. There we go. So, oh, I just missed it. But those pathways, the ones you saw around the side and around there, there's very little variation in pixel intensity as you go along. So if I remove those, it's not a big deal. Yeah. So we find those, and then one by one, we just remove them and shift the, the pixels in. Edges, find the paths, and take them out. Yeah, and you just duplicate layers instead of taking them out. You have to be a little bit careful because if you duplicate the same path all the time, it kind of looks weird because you insert bands in the image. But if you sort of alternate between different paths, yeah, they, like, they go about it. <laughs> I, I actually do have an implementation of this for Psychic's image. It's just a. Why is it edge detection important? What? Why is it edge detection important? Oh, it's just to make sure that. Um, yeah, that you don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you compute the gradient, then you find the path that traverses like that. You don't want to cross any <laughs> gradients. Uh, yeah, so, so they've gone further, and you can mark up areas of the image that you probably don't want to carve out. <laughs> ah, yes, there's a beach scene. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> I just take all of them out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah, so uh, so you can implement that one yourself uh, using using the shortest path algorithm inside of Scikit's image. It's in the graph graph submodule. If you want to find things inside of Scikit's image, you just go to the um, documentation. Uh, the you can always see on the side which version of the documentation you're looking at because if you have an older version of Scikit's image, you may not have uh, all the functions. So if you click on API reference, there's a list of all the functions inside of Scikit image. Scikit's image, so you can see, um, yeah, there's the graph module and it's got shortest path or you can use root through array, which basically you specify the start and the end point and it finds like the shortest path through the array that satisfies that constraint. Um, okay, let's look at some of the other examples. So contour finding is quite pretty. Um, the, these lines are superimposed on the original image. I just took some function. What function was it? Oh, uh, yeah, so, you know, sine of x to the power of 3 plus cosine of y squared. Plotted that, found the contours on it. It uses something called the uh, marching squares. Uh, and there we go. Uh, for the assignment, you may want to look at uh, gray level co-occurrence matrices. Uh, here we've got a couple of samples from the sky, a couple from the grass. And when you plot their properties, the gray level co-occurrence matrix properties, you see that they cluster very nicely. Um, histogram equalization that some of you may be familiar with. So you start off with a low contrast image. You can either, like just using that, um, uh, the this, this stretching uh, method that I described earlier, you can get something like this. Or if you use histogram equalization, it tries to basically make the cumulative distribution into a straight line, uh, which kind of causes weird looking images. Uh, so it's sometimes just better to just, you know, stretch the intensities. Um, radon transforms, like when you want to do, uh, this is basically the data, when you scan a, a, a brain like this or an object like this, uh, you get this out of your scanner and based on this you can do an inverse transform and recover your data. This is what happens inside of a CT scanner. Um, so, yeah, and some segmentation, which is super handy for when you want to manipulate objects. You can, like, provide seed points. It grows different areas, and you can... Uh, it's a random walker segmentation as well. So even in very noisy images, you can specify some seed points here and here, and it will grow it out for you, and... Uh, separate out the different layers. Um, yeah, so have a look at the gallery, see if there's any, anything useful, and uh, you're very welcome on the mailing list. If you've got any questions, we typically respond quite quickly, and uh, we'd love to help you to use these tools. Right, thanks for your attention. Do you want to present the breakout? Other oh, right. Other? So... Yeah, so uh, that was the idea of the scikits originally, but many of these projects kind of get a life of their own. Um, but it's it's very much a close collaboration, and you know there's good communication between the teams. So these things will always work together. And if I, I'm not sure if the goal is actually to move it over eventually, but the tools are definitely meant to be used together. Uh, so apparently, you guys see a lot of images of stars, but I I don't often. So I love working with star pictures. Uh, I provided to you with. Let me see if I can open this. Yeah. So I gave you the this is this is 
the output after a bunch of image processing that a guy did on numerous layers that he took with his stethoscope. He's got like the red, green, and blue filters applied, um, some other filters as well. So he's got four different layers that he provides. And if you combine those layers, you can get out a, a nice picture like this. So that is essentially the assignment, is to take, um, take these four gray level images that I provided and to try and combine them so that you have a very nice visualization, um, a color visualization of what you see there. So by the way, I made small versions of that in the tarball that says underscore small.zip. And there's, um, right before the dot PNG, there's an underscore SM. There are the large versions that you're capable of pulling over the 90 megabyte file. But if you can only pull over the 9 megabyte file, those will all be the same thing just with an underscore SM. <laughs> so uh, yeah, use the small images because the large ones are just too big. Uh, if you want to construct a color image, you want to set up a, a new array of size um, m by n by three. Uh, the three layers are red, green, and blue. Matplotlib knows that. So if you try and visualize a matrix like that, it will automatically assign the colors for you. Um, so try, for example, just take the red, green, and blue layers and you know, put them inside the three layers of an array and try and visualize that, see if that works, and then play around with how, can you, uh, how, you, uh, how you can add the fourth layer as well. The link I give to the website here basically describes exactly the pipeline that that person used, but uh, feel free to play around and use your own ideas.
Okay, so we're going to change gears a little bit to uh, machine learning in SciPy. So Scikits Learn is kind of your off-the-shelf machine learning uh, package in, in, uh, in Python. Um, make sure you have the most current version installed. The version uh, 0 0.9 doesn't have near the amount of functionality as 0 0.10. And with my nthought distribution, for some reason I had 0 0.9. So I would make sure that you have uh, 0.10 installed. Um, anyone having problems with the, the version? We need 10. Yeah. You have 9. There's the command. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what I want. <coughs> and to see the version, you can uh, do uh, import sk learn. And then do sklearn dot uh, uh, underscore underscore version underscore underscore. Okay, I'll I'll start lecturing. If anyone wants me to stop, just raise your hand. Um, so Scikit Learn provides easy to use, really general purpose machine learning in Python. So you might be asking, what is machine learning? Um, how many people here are familiar with machine learning? Okay, uh, that's good. So my short answer is that machine learning is kind of the offspring of statistics and computer science. It's kind of statistics algorithms for computer science applications or computer science uh, delving into, stati into statistics. And the types of problems are typically a little bit different than your classical statistics. Um, the better answer is that it's a set of models which aim to learn something about data to then apply that to future data. Um, so the, the statistical models using machine learning usually uh, concentrate on prediction problems. So you give me some new data, I want to know what class it is, or I want to know if this user would prefer this thing or this thing, or I want to tell you uh, some feature about that that new data that would be interesting to, to users. Uh, so there's, within uh, Scikit Learn, there's lots of different uh, uh, machine learning applications that we can, there's lots of different functionality for machine learning. Um, there's classification, so using some labels from some training data to learn a statistical model to then try to predict the label for new data. Um, there's learning the relationship between explanatory and response variables, so, uh, so regression problems where you try to predict some continuous valued uh, variable for new data. Uh, discovering nat natural clustering structure and data. So if you give me a bunch of data that has no labels, um, can I tell you how many natural uh, clusterings, or how many groups are forming uh, are, are within that data? And we saw a little bit uh, about this last week when we did some hierarchical clustering and some k-means. But there's a lot more clustering functionality within scikits learn. Uh, detection, detecting low dimensional structure and data. So I could have data that's, that has f uh, 50 attributes. So in this 50 dimensional space, is there a lower dimensional representation that kind of preserves all the information that's important in that data set? And then finding outliers in large data. So it's, it's not always easy, say, in 50, dimension, uh, 50 dimensional space to see what thing doesn't fit with uh, the rest of the data. And within Scikit's Learn, there's, there's really nice functionality for, for do, performing all of these tasks.
So to make this a little more concrete, um, here's a classic data set in statistics. It's called the IRIS data set, and it was uh, first uh, studied by R.A. Fisher. So here we have three different types of lilies, and we have four attributes measured for each of those lilies. Um, irises. Sorry, irises. That's it's, it's the iris data set. <laughs> not the <li> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Just by eye, he could tell that was an iris, not a lily. Um, <laughs> so we have uh, four attributes, this, uh, uh, having to do with the, the size of the, the petals and the sepals. Um, and three different classes. So there's three different varieties of iris, and they're represented by three different colors here. Uh, so typical thing that one might want to do is to learn some model that separates out these three different classes in this four-dimensional space. So then when we get measurements for a new flower, we could classify it into its subtype. Now, the, the neat thing about this data set is that it's not linearly, linearly separable. So only one of the classes, the red one here, is linearly separable, meaning we could draw a hyperplane in this four-dimensional space to separate out the classes. The green and the blue subtypes are not separable by, by any hyperplane. So we really need some flexible, say, non-parametric or non-linear models uh, to try to, to do this, to try to find out the, the boundary between these different subtypes. So I think that that's why this is a real uh, classical data set. Uh, and it also trying to find correlation structure between the different covariates. There's lots of really interesting problems that you could do with this, this type of data. Um, right. So the first sets of models that I'll be talking about is what we, we call a supervised learning, meaning we have a training set of objects uh, with some covariates and some known response. Uh, here the covariates are x, the response is y. So we want to build a model that can ingest an, a new x and predict the value of y. So in regression, the outcome variable is a continuous variable. So we have, we want to predict someone's age based on a bunch of different metrics about themselves. Uh, we want to predict the, the price of a house based on a bunch of different uh, attributes of that house. And in scikit-learn, there's a lot of different uh, regression tools that are available, uh, starting with linear regression. We saw that last week in SciPy, but there's also linear regression uh, and general, generalized li linear models in scikit-learn. Um, lasso and ridge regression are forms of uh, linear regression where you have regularization, so you might have high dimensional parameter spaces, but only a handful of those are actually important in predicting why, so it's a way of, of kind of culling down that huge dimensional space into something that's more tractable. And then there's a, a suite of non-parametric tools, uh, Gaussian process regression, nearest neighbors where you simply uh, vote the, or you take kind of local averages of data points within uh, smaller regions, uh, support vector regression, regression trees, uh, and, and there's a lot more than this. Um, and I highly recommend that you look at uh, the Scikits Learn website. They have really nice documentation and references for each of these methods, and dozens and dozens of examples. And it's it's actually it's it's a very uh, it's a very nice, nicely documented piece of code. So um, take a look at at that. Of course, there's also classification where we want to predict something's class based on its covariates. Um, a lot of different methods within uh, uh, scikit's learn for this, uh, beginning with logistic regression. Uh, K-nearest neighbors classification, both linear and quadratic discrimination analysis, naive base, support vector machines, uh, classification trees, random forests. And some of these methods are only applicable to, to two-class problems, so kind of yes, no, zero, one problems. But they're extendable within uh, learn using the multi-class submodule 
or you can do a one versus rest. So you basically, uh, if you had a K class problem where K is more than two, you could do uh, one versus the rest in K different classifiers and then vote those classifiers to do a multi-class problem. Uh, say one versus one, you would build you know, K choose two classifiers and vote those to end up with a, a multi-class uh, labeling scheme. Uh, some of these classifiers naturally handle multiple classes, such as uh, trees are famously easily extendable to multiple classes. But any of the classifiers you can extend using the multi-class module, which is, uh, which is nice. Uh, you can also do feature selection using the feature selection module. Uh, so if you had really high dimensional feature spaces, you can figure out, you can try to figure out the uh, uh, the, the subset of features that are, are most predictive for, your, uh, for what you're trying to do. So for instance, in image classification, you could build up these sets of millions of features, but perhaps only 10 of them are actually predictive of, of the class of the, the image. So it's a nice set of tools for trying to figure out structure in this high dimensional feature space. Any questions so far? I'm moving too fast, too slow. Good. Okay. So let's just go through an example of doing this uh, model fitting in scikit-learn. Um, uh, a nice thing about learn is that there's a lot of built-in data sets too. So if we just import data sets, there's a couple dozen classical data sets from the literature, including the iris data. Here I've loaded the, uh, the Boston house prices data, which uh, has 13 features. So this is kind of a, there's a bunch of neighborhoods and we have information about each of the neighborhoods. And the response variable, so the thing we want to predict is the median house price in that neighborhood. Okay, so this is a regression problem. The median house price uh, is Continuous, continuous random variable. So we want to build a predictive model that takes in as input a new value of x and produces a prediction for the median house price. So we can do linear regression. So we just do import linear model. Uh, this is instantiating the linear, uh, linear, ma uh, linear regression object. Let's split the data in two and uh, fit, the mod fit the linear regression on half the data to predict for the other half. So this is just the first half. This is, uh, this is the number of data points um, from one to n over two. Uh, this is how we fit the linear regression model. It's simple, it's just the, the object dot fit x, y. And then prediction is also easy, it's just the object dot predict, and then the x variable that we want to predict on. So here we fit on the first half from one to half, and we predicted for the second half from half to the end of the vector, uh, the matrix, sorry. Uh, here's a plot, so we can plot the residuals as a function of the true uh, median house prices. And this is what it looks like. Uh, so the mean square error is something like 300. It's linear regression doesn't do so well. Um, not too surprising, this is a really difficult data set. So let's try something else. We can do uh, k nearest neighbor regression. So we just import neighbors. Um, there's a set of pre-processing tools in Learn, which is uh, highly useful. Um, here I've simply scaled the X matrix, so uh, for each of the 13 covariates in this, this big eight X matrix, I have subtracted the mean and div divided by the standard deviation. And that's often important uh, for several methods that use kind of distances between points. So for instance, K nearest neighbors will compute the distance between each object and each other object. And if things aren't scaled, then certain uh, predictors might have more or less influence in that uh, in, the, in that distance. What are the distributions that Yeah, so it, typically it works pretty well. It's, it, it's not 
it doesn't really have to do with Gaussianity more than making sure, if you just write down what a Euclidean distance is, uh, if things aren't scaled, if then each, then there's like a, a different weight that, cor that is proportional to the standard deviation of that measurement. So more or less. So that goes from 0 to 1 and a whole bunch going from 0 to 1 and then it goes from minus, you know, 10 to the 23 and the other one from 10 to the 23. That one will have all the power unless you just scale yeah, it. It's just not clear that the standard deviation is always the right thing to just take it If you have like a strong final distribution. Sure, yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. and, and but you can scale by max, max min and that all goes in the Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure that there are different commands for different types of scaling. Um, So, I mean, the reason I did is I, I, I tried KNN regression without scaling first, and I got really <laughs> weird answers, so, that, oh, i got to scale this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I didn't play with different scaling, but there's... Yeah, preprocessing has a whole, if you just do preprocessing dot, you get that position. So we've got a whole bunch of different ways to scale. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then I fit a K nearest neighbor regression using five nearest neighbors, just arbitrarily. Um, again, we can fit it and predict really easily. And the residuals still don't look so good. Mean square error is much lower, though. You can see we're, we're overestimating for small price uh, house values and, and underestimating for large uh, values. But the mean square error is much better than linear regression, like by a factor of 10. Uh, okay. So. Typically, what we want to ask ourselves in doing machine learning, uh, we're trying to model, so uh, talking more of uh, in the supervised context, we're trying to, to, to model how some set of variables relate to some other set of variables. But the, the number one question we want to ask ourselves is how is our model going to perform on future data? We want a predictive model. So if we feed new, new data into it, we get accurate predictions of the, the variable of interest. So in the previous example, I simply split the data, fit on the first half, uh, what I call the training data, and then evaluate the performance of the model in the second half, what I call the testing data. So this is kind of train test strategy. Uh, it avoids overfitting to the training data because we're evaluating on a set of data that was not explicitly trained on. But it's not necessarily the best thing to do because it kind of waste data. We have this extra data that we could have fit to, but we didn't, we didn't actually use it in the fitting. So uh, a better procedure is cr uh, cross-validation. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with cross-validation, uh, the easiest thing is leave one out cross-validation, where we take out one data point, fit the model to the rest, and then predict what the value of that left out data point uh, should have been using the, the model iterate that over all of the data points, and then our, our, uh, our average uh, error is simply the, those prediction errors, uh, the leave one out prediction errors, um, compared with the true value which we have for all the data. So then if we were to get another data point, uh, the hopes is that the cross-validation error is more or less the expected error for the new data. Okay, and the reason this is important is that we typically are trying to choose a model that will work well for new data. So we want to get a handle on how the performance will be uh, for new data, even though we, don't, we haven't seen that new data yet. So cross-validation is a way of trying to estimate that. Um, so leave one out is, is nice. Um, it's computationally expensive because you have to fit whichever model that you're using n different times, where n is your total training set size. So people typically use k-fold cross-validation, where you just chunk up your data, your training data, into k sets, hold that one, fit on the rest, predict for the how that set, iterate over all the, uh, over all the folds. Okay. Uh, luckily for us, uh, scikits has cross-validation. <laughs> if that was a little too complicated. <laughs> so, um, okay, these are important concept concepts, but it's hard to cover all this in a half an hour. So, uh, 
And again, the documentation on scikit-learn is really nice. So take a look at, uh, at that, the manual and all of the references within. Right, so like I said, we, we want to say we're, we're faced with a classification task. We want to pick uh, the model that we expect to do, to, to do best on future data. So for instance, which of these models should I use? Should I do a K nearest neighbor? If so, with how many neighbors? Uh, support vector machine, there's lots of tuning parameters within support, support vector machine. Uh, random forest, there's lots of, you know, how many trees? There's other tuning parameters. Gaussian processes, same thing. So there's all these decisions that we have to make in trying to choose the best model. Um, within Learn, there's this uh, grid, so grid search module that allows us to more or less automatically try to pick the best uh, model for our data. So what it does is if you just run this command, so an estimator is a class of model. So if we instantiated, say, a random forest estimator, we feed in that object, uh, some parameter grid, which is just a dictionary, uh, where the names are the, uh, the names of the, uh, of the tuning parameters of the random forest, plus whatever values we want to search over. Um, uh, a loss function, so a function that we want to minimize, or we could, uh, or a score function, something we, we want to maximize. So, for instance, we might want to minimize the number of errors that we make uh, in a classification problem. And we can run that on n jobs cores, with uh, CV being the number of fold cross-validation Ds. So we can simply just run this line of code, and it will pick to pick for us the best model to use for that data. Um, so inherent in this is uh, some loss function or score function. And there's lots of different built-in evaluation metrics. Uh, so for instance, a 0, 1 loss function is just the, the classification loss. So in a classification problem, you get uh, a score, you get a, a loss of one, a penalty of one if you get the classification wrong, and a penalty of zero if you get it right. So we want to minimize that. Um, uh, mean square error, so in a regression case, we want to minimize the mean square error. There's other, lots of other metrics that we want to, say, maximize. So the zero one score is just the, the number, or sorry, the percent of the time that we're correct in a classification problem. Uh, there's other things related to uh, precision, recall, ROC curves. Uh, there's lots of nice built-in ones. Of course, we can write our own. Uh, other evaluation plots, you can look at confusion matrices, ROC curves. I'll show some examples of this in a second. Uh, but it's really nice that th they've thought hard about this. And there's lots of ways that you can evaluate uh, the performance of your, of your machine learning algorithm that are built, in, built right into scikit's learn. Okay, so let's go to the notebook. Hello, superhero. Wow. <laughs> okay, so what I've done is I've so built into the to learn is this famous NIST handwritten digits classification data set. So the idea is that um, there's a database of handwritten images from 0 to 9. And based on those images, we want to classify whether it's a, a, a 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. So here's an example. These are just the, the first 10 images in the data set. There's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Uh, so what I want to do is just, so we've seen a lot of, uh, in the last hour, we saw a lot of ways to uh, extract features and do lots of processing on these images. What I'm going to do is just use the raw pixel images, uh, the raw pixel values to try to classify the images. So these are all 8x8 eight eight images. So there's 64 uh, features per image. And so I want basically a model that can ingest a new s vector of size 64 and produce me a, a, a best guess number. So which digit is it? 
Okay, so I've taken the first 500 data points as the training set um, and the rest as a testing set. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a cross validation within this 500, uh, these 500 objects to try to, uh, to, to then apply to, I'm tr so I'm, I'm, I'm treating the testing set as, data, as kind of the future data, the data that I don't have yet, but uh, that I'll see in the future. So it's just a way of, of evaluating my performance. <clears throat> and so I'm going I'm to create a classifier. I'm just going to use a support vector machine. So S, a support vector machine basically looks for separating hyperplanes between your, uh, your data. So uh, SVMs work as a two-class problem. But we're going to do a, a one versus one version of that. So just by default, it does a one versus one. So it'll first, you know, take all the zeros and all the ones, give me the hyperplane that separates those in feature space. And then move on to zero versus two, et cetera, et cetera, and do all those combinations. And at the end, it's going to vote uh, the, all the individual classifiers to come up with a, a prediction. So then when I get a new digit, it basically runs it through all those classifiers to get predictions in each of those n choose two classifiers and then votes them to get a final uh, prediction. But uh, we don't need to know all that. <laughs> all we need to do is uh, run this, these couple lines of code. And so uh, what I've done, I've instantiated the uh, classifier. This gamma here is a tuning parameter, so I'm using a radial basis function kernel. So it's actually a, a nonlinear, it's a, a kernelized form of support, ve support vector machine. Uh, fit it on the training set and then try to predict for the left out objects. So here, uh, I've basically, I've, I've trained a classifier and I've predicted for this choice of tuning parameter. And for the first 10 objects in the testing set, so this is the left out objects, uh, here's the true class, and here's a predicted class. So I made one mistake here, but it looks like the rest are correct. OK. Um, we can also compute all these different metrics, so the 0, 1 loss, the 0, 1 score. We can look at the confusion matrix. So I'll show you what all these look like. So this takes as input the true value. So this YTE is the true uh, digit. And here is the predicted digit. And so 0, 1 loss is 253. So that I got 253 of the 17, uh, 1,200. The testing set is 1,297. So this is, this is just uh, on the testing set. So I got 253 uh, wrong out of the 1,200. Uh, I got 80% of them right. That's a 0, 1 score. The confusion matrix is, so the i jth, the i jth entry is the number of objects truly in group i, but predicted to be in group j. So here is the 0, 0. There's 108 zeros that I correctly called 0. Uh, looks like. It's the eight, yeah. So the, yeah. It's zero, one, two. Yeah, it's it's the eight. Yeah, so it's counting from zero here. So the eights is a problem source, right? So there's a lot of things that aren't that aren't actually eight that I'm calling eight. So the classifier here is is making a lot of errors by trying to call everything eights. Presumably, eights look like a lot of the other digits. Um, so let's just plot a few that, that the classifier gets wrong. Can you, um, can you set the uh, interpolation to nearest? Is it just ugly? <laughs> oh, at this, yeah. Well, uh, so yeah. I want to show how ugly they look, though, because I got them wrong. No, no, but I was just a one. Right here, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, nearest. Interpolation. Okay, thank you. That's that's what the 
Yeah. Yeah. So would it be smart to first do interpolation and then increase essentially the resolution of the data? So because it looked a lot easier. Where it says true three predict today, when it was interpolated. So uh, easy for your eye, but there's no extra information there. So. I, so actually, it's this is a pretty easy problem. I purposely picked a bad tuning parameter to show that we could increase our performance from there. <laughs> <laughs> actually, so, so I actually, first I, I picked a really good one. I was like, ah, oh, this is actually the optimum that I picked out of the air. So anyway, so this was a one, we called it an eight. This is a two, we called it an eight. A three, we called it a nine, et cetera. Um, we, don't do, we don't do perfectly, but uh, uh, so I'll skip precision and recall. Um, uh, you can do, uh, so the default is do a one versus one. We can do a one versus rest. So we're zero versus everything else, one versus everything else, and then vote those classifiers. Um, I think here it does, does a little bit better. Oh, it does about 10% better. So typically one versus one usually does better. The decision boundaries tend to be simpler when you just consider pairwise classes, but it's not always the case. Um, so SVMs do not give class probabilities, meaning they don't give you a probability of being a class given the data. But there's this thing called plat scaling, which gives you an approximation of the probability, uh, essentially by looking at how far the data point falls from the decision boundary. Um, so there's, if we do probability equals true in the support vector machine, we can actually get class probabilities for each of these guys. And here I've just shown for the first six objects what the probability that the digit equal two was. So for the one, for the first one that was actually two, we have a 99% probability. For the second one, it's actually quite low. That's one of the ones we got wrong. Uh, this just shows how we can make an ROC curve. Uh, so the ROC curve plots the false positive rate versus the true positive rate. Um, for those who don't know what that is, I suggest looking it up. Um, a perfect classifier would be up here. And you see there's a trade-off here. As we change the probability threshold, we trade the true positives for rate for the uh, false positive rate. Uh, so we trade a, uh, a higher true positive rate for a lower false positive rate. Um, OK, so I just wanted to get, show the tuning the classifier. So like I said, um, I just arbitrarily chose this value of the tuning parameter with a radial basis function kernel. Um, but what we really want to do is optimize over, say, a grid, a grid of uh, parameters. So it's done quite easily in this grid search. And we can use, uh, here, I've used two cores with a five-fold cross-validation. And my metric is the 0, 1 score. So I'm trying to maximize the 0, 1 score um, with respect to all these parameters. So I can do that. Uh, so my best cross-validated 0, 1 score is 0.986. So in the training set, the cross-validation error rate is 1.4%. And this is the optimal model. Uh, gamma was 0.001, radial basis function kernel. Uh, and yeah, I could do the same with random forest, but this actually takes a while. So it's, it's very similar. Um, how much time do I have? OK. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's. The dog stream should tell you, right? Yes. Uh, it should. Does it? I'm sure it does. I'm sure it says something. Let's see. Um, so it's, it's doing a kernel SVM. <clears throat> and. So in regular SVM, you just look for separating hyperplanes. Uh, where is my cursor here? 
How do I expand this thing? So, uh, where's the gamma? Kernel coefficient. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I suggest you look it up. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's basically doing inner products between kernels, and it, so it takes a specific form of this kernel, and uh, you can think of it as kind of like a, a distance operator in a sense, and that tuning parameter, I think it's it's dividing, it's dividing by that. So things that are, it's it's essentially projecting your data into a higher dimensional parameter space and looking for. Uh, for for linear boundaries in that space, and the space that it that it projects it to is based on this tuning parameter. So it's kind of like how complicated is that higher dimensional space? And how does it go with gamma getting larger and smaller? Um, I think as it gets smaller, it it gets kind of bumpier, so it gets more complex. Usually with SVMs, I find if if gamma gets too small, it just go, goes crazy, and if it's uh, if it's too large, it's kind of over smooths a little too much. There's this, this is a bias variance thing going on. Anyone else can chime in too if they know support vector machines better. <laughs> okay, um, and just a couple other things I wanted to let me see our guy again. Um, so there's lots of other functionality within the scikits learn. Um, there's lots of unsupervised learning methods. So unsupervised learning is you have a bunch of data, you don't necessarily, and, and you don't know the response. So there's no re kind of response variable that you're interested in, like a class. Uh, th there might be underlying, but you don't have that information. Um, so we saw clustering last week with k-means and hierarchical clustering. So here we're trying to detect uh, natural clusters in our data. Um, so LEARN also has mixture models, something called affinity propagation, uh, spectral clustering, which is uh, a kind of related idea where you, you have uh, high dimensional data and low dimensional structure that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to simultaneously learn the lower dimensional structure and the clustering structure within that data. And there's lots of, so evaluating clustering is often difficult you can kind of look at it and say, oh, that looks reasonable. But there's quite a few evaluation metrics in the literature, and they've actually adopted a lot of those. So you can kind of compare the output of k-means using five and six clusters and see rigorously uh, uh, whether one is better than the other. Uh, there's a lot of manifold learning. So this is where we have a uh, high dimensional data set and we're trying to find lower dimensional non-linear structure and there's quite a few methods out there and there's like maybe five or six that are implemented and learn uh, matrix factorization so PCA so PCA is kind of a is a, a linear dimensionality reduction technique uh, they have kernel PCA which is a non-linear version PCA, sparse PCA, independent components analysis, non-negative matrix factorization, dictionary learning. These are all things that are uh, useful for f finding uh, correlation structure in, in high uh, dimensions. We can also do outlier detection. Uh, this is something called the elliptic envelope, which assumes that you have Gaussian data and it looks for deviations from that. Uh, the one class support vector machine is a pretty popular technique where you uh, assume that everything comes from one class. So you try to draw a separating hyperplane around the things that you know are not outliers and everything that, anything that pops away from that is presumably an outlier. And then covariance estimation, usually in high dimensions. Um, it's missing a few things. Uh, these are things that I think are pretty important that aren't in LEARN. So LEARN can do a lot. It can't yet do everything. But it seems like, at least from version 9 to version 10, they've added a lot. So I would be very surprised if they weren't uh, considering adding a lot of these things that are not currently there. Some of them are in other That's true. 
That's true. But for the amount of things that Learn does implement, it seems like it's not too much of a stretch for them to, to do it. There's a, there's a lot of good stuff here. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I guess we have time to either do a breakout or I can show you some more stuff on mani manifold learning. Oh, there's a prep piece. Maybe a breakout would be useful so people can sure. Yeah, yeah, so uh, the, the notebook is posted online already. So, Okay, so the breakout is the iris data. Um, so I want you to choose your favorite classification model. So first of all, uh, like I said, it's, it's uh, in a data sets module. It's one of the preloaded data. So you can just fire it up, split it into a training and testing set, just using these commands. And then choose your favorite classification model. Uh, find the parameters that maximize a three-fold cross-validation cross zero, one score uh, over the training set and then apply this to predict the class of each object in the held out set. And I want to see what's your, your best, so what's your, your maximal three-fold cross-validation score, and then what's your uh, zero-one score on the testing set using that model. And the best I was able to do was one mistake on the testing set. That was a <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Okay. So, point one one is a viable tool on GitHub, which is what I did. I had trouble with easy install on GitHub as well. So getting it. Scikit.learn. Uh, 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 dash learn. Dash learn. Yeah. So did you do a did you use sudo? Yeah. It wasn't that like I had to test install. Did all sorts. So.
looks okay. Okay, so we're going to finish up with a, a very brief overview of the stats model package, which uh, is also within Scikits. So uh, Josh sent around an email uh, earlier with some installation instructions. So uh, I presume most of you will have installed the package by now. If not, you can pull it from GitHub in your own time uh, or install it using easy install. If you haven't installed, the import command is, is shown there. Um, it does have one difference to uh, the import command has one difference to other commands in that it ex stats models explicitly has an API that you call. That's just a consolidated interface for all the different modules in, in stats models. So instead of import scikits.statsmodels, you should import that .api as SM. Okay, so this, uh, uh, these slides are just a brief introduction to what stats models is uh, and how it can be used. And then I have a notebook as well, which many of you will have downloaded that contains uh, examples. So stats models is aimed at uh, statistical modeling uh, and uh, a computation uh, with uh, NumPy and SciPy, as many of the other Scikit's packages are. But uh, it has uh, a focus on econometric modeling uh, and linear models particularly. Uh, and as a result of that, it has to, to my eye, quite a frequentist flavor rather than a Bayesian uh, flavor. So there is another package, which I won't talk about today, called PyMC, that I think uh, we might talk about a little later, later on, that does uh, much more Bayesian likelihood analysis. But uh, for many kinds of tasks in which one wants to use uh, linear models, uh, then stats models is a very good package to, to use. So uh, as with uh, SciPy and um, most SciKids packages, Stats models is built on NumPy arrays, so virtually everything you use will be a NumPy array, <laughs> or uh, data types from within pandas. Pandas has only been mentioned once or twice so far. Uh, it's uh, a, a, another package that you can download that provides very versatile and full-featured data structures. So it's something that is uh, still being developed and, and uh, is becoming uh, much, much more common. So within the time series analysis part of stats models, the pandas time series data structure is, is uh, available uh, for use at the moment. So stats models is available through all the usual sources. Uh, importantly, and, and not uh, trivially, it's already compatible with Python 3. Uh, and stats models is uh, almost entirely pure Python with a couple of Scython wrappings. OK, so uh, resources. Uh, the Scikit's homepage. Uh, this uh, second point in documentation is uh, pretty good, uh, so it's very useful for learning about how to use stats models. Uh, the repositories, and then also these slides are very useful if you're wanting to see what you can do with um, with stats models. Uh, these two presentations from the SciPy conference in 2010 and 2011 uh, will are very useful. So Skipper Siebold, who's the author of the 2010 presentation, he's one of the principal authors of Stats Models. And Wes McKinney, who is 2011 presenter, is the author of Pandas, the data structure module that I talked about. Uh, and so uh, both of these people are, are active developers for this software and for many important uh, data software and analysis tools in Python. So they're, they're very well uh, worth reading those slides. OK, so uh, as with scikits.learn, stats models has some uh, inbuilt data sets. Uh, so if you've imported uh, the stats models API as SM, for instance, then sm.datasets.tab will show you the list of data sets that are available. Here is one. This is uh, the data set from the uh, vote in Scotland in 1997 to devolve tax powers from Westminster to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, so you can explore uh, that data set as you see fit. Uh, the, the, I'm, I, I read that the, the data files that it loads do contain the names of the Scottish councils, but when you load it in this way, you don't get the names of the Scottish councils, unfortunately. So if you want to hear some exotic Scottish names, you should uh, investigate that data set further. OK, so uh, more seriously, um, these data sets, uh, and I think this is true of stats models generally, the, uh, X and Y, the dependent and independent uh, 
variables, a cast is either endogenous or ex exogenous. So these terms reflect the background of the developer of stats models, which is in econometrics uh, and macroeconomics. So these are not words I commonly encounter in my research, but I hear dependent and independent variables. And that's more or less uh, what you're doing. You have the thing that is underlying the model, and then you have the things you're trying to fit, or things that bear on uh, the variations that you observe in your data. Okay, so as I mentioned, with the time series analysis part of stats models, Panda's time series structure is available for use. And yes, ultimately, stats models is targeted at, in the words of its creator, statistical, financial, e econometric, and, uh, econ and econometric models. I copied and pasted that from someone else's slides, so that's not a typo on my part. Um, <laughs> yes, so those... Um, that, that's the the flavour that stats models has, but nevertheless, the tools that it provides are, are very full-featured and, and very applicable in a variety of contexts. So let's get on to actually talking about those tools. The most fundamental thing that stats models does is provide a number of regression routines that allow you to fit to data under a number of circumstances. So uh, the, the basic regression idea uh, that stats models implements is least squares routines, and it provides uh, ordinary least squares weighted least squares and uh, generalized least squares. So ordinary least squares is where you have uh, a set of data and the variance properties of those data, uh, they're independent and they're, uh, not, that variance structure is not changing with time. Weighted least squares allows uh, for the covariance matrix to, between the data to be non-identical, to be non-diagonal. Sorry, it allows the diagonal of the, the covariance matrix to vary. And then generalized least squares allows for providing a full covariance matrix between your data. So I will switch to the, the, the notebook now to actually give an example of what I mean. Oop, wrong way. Here we go. So is this uh, loaded? Oh. There we go. OK. So we import uh, NumPy and, well, it's probably already imported, and, and uh, stats models. Hopefully that will work. Very good. OK. So this is a very simple example. Uh, I am going to uh, generate data that uh, obey this function. So it's a quadratic function uh, with noise added on. And then we're going to regress the values of the coefficients using ordinary least squares and then with weighted least squares. So we generate 100 data points uh, for the x-axis. And so then this uh, builds our model. And it's worth appreciating exactly um, what the input model to stats model should look like. So let's unpack this line. Uh, so column stack turns this vector x. So let's, let's print x. There we go. So x is just the numbers 0 to 10, 100 regularly, linearly spaced. OK, so it, this creates a larger matrix with three columns. The first column is x squared. So this is what the column stack does. It stacks x squared and x. And then, so that's a numpy command, column stack. Maybe you've encountered it before in numpy. And then this second is uh, in stats models, add constant. And it creates an extra column uh, here on the end. So it's not prepended, it's postpended uh, of constant values. OK, so the, why, why are we doing this? So here, here's the structure of x. You've got x squared in one column, x in another column, and a constant value in a third column. So you might wonder why exactly is, is one doing this? It's because we want to build a data set that's based on linear, uh, linear operations on this matrix. So we're going to take a set of coefficients. So here, what we're going to regress for our input data is the function 0.1x squared plus x plus 10. And so we generate the y data in this example by using matrix multiplication on this vector and this matrix. OK, so this creates a vector, which is the same size as little x, 1 by 100. And so uh, with random noise. So here we go. Let's, let's have a look. So here's the x-axis, and here's the y-axis, which is the function that we've specified with these coefficients with some noise applied to it. Is it faster to do that than just say, you know, y equals x squared 0.1? No, this isn't for efficiency. It's, it's because when, when it comes to regressing the coefficients, this matrix, big X, 
is the thing that is going to be input into the regression function. So this isn't a case of specifying here is a functional form that I would like you to fit. For that, which in my mind I associate as being a more Bayesian approach, PyMC provides functionality for that. Stats models provides what are linear models. That doesn't mean it has to be a straight line. Linear models means it's operations that revolve around matrices, yeah? Okay, so now that we've set it up, we just do the regression in, in the following manner. SM.OLS is the ordinary least squares regression. So note that I input the Y values and also the matrix X. So this has three columns and it says, for each of these columns, find the coefficients, three coefficients, such that you, you fit the data well. And this uh, stores the fit, so OLS itself is just uh, the package. It has many functions. If you, if we tab, you can see, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Anyway, all right, no, I won't, I won't fuss around with that. Um, so that, that performs the fit and saves the output in an object called results. So let's, uh, let's explore this object results. So results has a summary method that prints out a very nicely formatted table of lots of statistics and information about the regression that you've just performed. Okay, so it provides really a lot of things, um, but it, the, the most, here are the actual values that it's regressed, so you, uh, and here are some estimates of the uh, diagonal of the covariance matrix, and then you also have a confidence interval. Uh, it gives an F statistic, uh, for the model itself, it gives a log likelihood and it provides information criteria. So there are many, and my goodness, I, I'm not even sure what these things are. So, uh, but if you are working in a field where uh, this sort of analysis is uh, commonly, uh, sort of the common thing that you would do in the course of your work, so econometrics is an example of this, then it's extremely nice to be able to have the regression put out uh, in that format. So anyway, let's, let's actually see if it's any good. So yes, it is. You can see the input data and you, then you can see the fitted uh, values which are stored in results.fitted values. So results has quite a lot in it. Here are the parameters, that it, the best fit parameters, and here's the actual covariance matrix for those parameters. So it's three by three. So let's take, this gives a full list of all the things that results has in it. So you can recall results. Uh, that's a misspelling. Akaike's information criteria, the Bayes information criteria. Uh, so everything you saw summarized in that table and more uh, is available here. The parameters, the fitted values, the residuals. Often you might want to fit an ordinary least squares to a model as a starting point and then examine the residuals to see if you need to use a more complicated model. Okay. Um, Stats models provides detrending, so uh, just uh, at a just at, to a polynomial whose order you specify. So here we're going. I'm detrending uh, a linear relationship from the quadratic data. So you, uh, it's easiest if I show a plot. And here's the x data with the noise, but with the linear trend, the overall linear trend removed. So at the beginning, the quadratic term. You can see the quadratic term in the offset. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't do any model selection. That's right. Uh, so the idea here is that you will, in, in this case, obviously, I generated the data using that model. But in real life, the data is not uh, found in that way. So yeah, you have to specify a model. And so the F statistic, which was output, if we go up. This F, actually, maybe even in the docs. No, it's just going to say fitted value of the F. F. So this is uh, a measure, a, quanti a quantity that measures uh, some information about the degree of model selection. So if you have two different models, you can compare the F statistics for those. In a Bayesian context, you'd compute the Bayesian evidence or the Bayes factor to compare the two models. Yeah. Also yes, yes, yep. So these are both measures of models. So. Right, so I, I, I'm not going to do any model selection here. Okay, so this is a small extension of ordinary least squares to weighted least squares. I'm going to apply weights so I'm going to change how the noise varies. Same input data, same functions and coefficients, but I've modified the noise now. So then it starts out noisy at the beginning, 
And then as time goes on, maybe postdocs are taking over the measurement and the measurement gets better and better or something like that. And so you can do the same thing uh, again with uh, OLS, which in this case is not the optimal fitting routine because the noise properties are varying and OLS assumes that that isn't the case. However, if you have a model for the weights, which in this case I've specified in advance, so it's very easy, you can perform weighted least squares using WLS, which uh, has the same call as before, but you also additionally specify the weights now. So we perform the same fit, and those are the best fitting parameters, and more to the point, let's actually look. And so you can see there's a difference between the two. Uh, so the argument here is that the red line, which is the weighted least squares result, is a better representation of the data, though. Mm. According, I don't know, you be the judge. Uh, I think it's probably right. It's because these high points right at the end here, which have very small variances, are dominating the fit. So the weighted least squares is making, sparing every expense to make sure that it goes through the final few data points, whereas the ordinary least squares is missing by a bit. Uh, no, that's plus residuals, it's not very interesting. Okay, Okay. so uh, I was going to switch back to the slides now. Does anyone have any questions at this point about the regression? Any comments? That was a good comment from before, so more like that. That's certainly very welcome. No, okay. So let's talk a little bit about time series analysis and regression. So... Uh, yeah, time series analysis is very full featured. The SM.TSA module provides a number of uh, very fundamental rudimentary time series analysis methods such as auto and cross correlation and covariance uh, as those four functions. It generates a periodogram for, for regularly spaced data uh, uh, using that. Uh, it's, it's just a periodogram. Um, yeah, many of the basic routines like autocorrelation and uh, autocovariance are already available through NumPy and SciPy. So the power of stats models is not in providing those routines. Rather, it lies in the uh, estimation methods that you can use uh, on time series data. And so the example I'm going to talk about now is one of these. So the things that are available are univariate and vector autoregressive processes and auto, also uh, autoregressive moving average processes. So we're going to switch to a uh, discussion in the notebook now about um, those. So anyway, let's. Uh, this is just a, an example of the rudimentary time series analysis first. So I found some EEG uh, data uh, on the internet. I downloaded it. Uh, you can do the same thing. Uh, so here we go. This actually shows what it is. So this is... Uh, bunch of EEG data. I have uh, 32 channels. I've just selected one channel. It, it has uh, 30,000 points, so it's very dense. Uh, so this is sort of neuroimag neuroimaging data. And so it's a very dense time series. And so you can take its autocorrelation and plot it. There we go. So you can see the autocorrelation has some structure in it. Uh, and similarly, one can plot the uh, autocovariance. Uh, and this routine down here was just simply to point out that uh, you have the same functionality in, in NumPy. So it can actually, this is as to, to plot the same thing as up here. So that, that isn't where the action's at in stats models. Uh, and that's a periodogram. Okay, let's get on to where the action is, which is vector, uh, or, or those uh, processes I talked about. So the example I'm going to give here is a vector autoregressive process of macroeconomic data. So I wanted to do something with macroeconomic data. Um, and... Uh, it turns out that the example on the stats models website is uh, with macroeconomic data. So I've just taken that here and modified it only a little. So this is something that you can uh, also work through very easily yourself. So I uh, am not an expert in vector autoregressive processes, and I'm going to assume that you aren't either. So I'll give a brief overview of what a vector autoregressive process is. The idea is that I have t observations of k variables. Okay, so k could be band where you're observing, uh, you know, the universe could be, like, if we, we're astronomers, so this is very common uh, for us to encounter time series data where we have uh, the brightness of objects in a number of different filters, red, blue, infrared, etc. Okay, and so a vector autoregressive process says, 
I want to describe the relationship in my data based on the idea that because the t -ax, the x-axis is, is time, that what has come before should be determining what is coming after. And you want to describe fully the relationship between all the different bands rather than treating each one individually. Okay? So can everyone see the ambition of, of what we're trying to, trying to do? And so the way we do that in a, a linear framework is to construct, as we say, the vector y of, for each of the variables we're modeling at time t is going to be a sum of the, a, a matrix which describes the relationship between the four different bands at a previous time summed over however many previous times you'd like. So in general, you could take it, if you thought your data had a very long baseline, you could say, I want to look at uh, all the bands uh, over this time interval, and then these matrices are the coefficients that relate uh, all those bands at a particular time. So does everyone see how this uh, this works? And then there's a, a noise term as well. So uh, in my mind, this is more easily expressed in a big matrix equation, which uh, has the following notation. So the total output, that is all of the k by t that you see, uh, is described by this sequence of correlation matrices times uh, the previous data and plus a noise term. And the idea is that you want to regress these coefficients. So that maybe wasn't terribly clear. Does anyone... Uh, maybe if I write on the board, it will be clear what, clearer what we're trying to do. Um, I might do it over here. Do you mind if I rub these out? Even though it's not entirely out of place. Um, so the idea is I have a vector of data at time t. Okay? And so I've got four, say, let's say just three observations at that time. And I want to describe how this these data can be inferred from observations at all previous times. So let's imagine I take the three values at the previous interval. Okay? And then I have a 3 by 3 matrix here. This is 3 by 3. Which of coefficients, which tells me how I mix these values to get these values. Okay? And so you could fit for this matrix by solving, like using a matrix solver to, to evaluate those coefficients. Okay. But of course, in practice, there's more than just the immediately previous step. If you have a Markov process, this is a very good description, but in general, in physical processes, you have to go further back. So the idea is that instead of just taking the previous one, I have another matrix now for the previous time. So let's call this A t minus 1, and now this is going to be A t minus 2, and here's the vector of data at t minus 2. Okay? And then the idea is that I sum up those contributions from however many previous matrices. Okay? And so that's all this, this equation is. It's saying you take... Uh, you're, you, what you're saying is that you want your final data to be described in terms of all the previous data that you have and some coefficients which you don't know. And the whole point of a vector autoregressive process is to regress these coefficients. Okay, I think we got there. Okay, so let's actually do this. So um, we can load some macroeconomic data. Let's have a look at it. So the top is GDP. So this is uh, gross domestic product for the entire United States in the quarters from, I think, about 1951 to 2005, maybe. And this is expressed in billions of US dollars, 2005 US dollars. So as you can see, that's up is positive trend is good. Uh, well, if you, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I <laughs> in the capitalist model of society, then up is a good thing. Um, OK, so uh, and the other two uh, variables here are, oh man, I forgot what the other two are. This is why I had this tab open. One is GDP, and the other one is consumption, and the third one is private investment. Okay, so they fluctuate the... Okay. All right, anyway. 
for the purpose of, of demonstrating autoregressive processes, we have three values. So, um, yeah. Are there nice uh, time series plotting machines? Within, within stats models? So, yes, but they rec they're not documented. So there are actually, if you look through the Python files, there are a number of nice, um, so you can see here I used this call, which took in like a three by n, took in three time series data and knew that it should plot them in this manner. So what happened here was that the author thought, oh, that's a useful thing, I'll write a script to do that, and then save that script and there it is, okay? But I'm referring to the, there's no time on the... Like oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so far as I know, that would have to be added by hand. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, Uh, so, when we're performing the regression, we're not actually going to regress the data itself, but rather the differences. So, we, the aim is we're going to uh, regress the values of the differences between the data. And the reason for this is that here are, is that vector order regressive processes work best on data sets that have the property of stationarity. And when you don't have uh, or aren't guaranteed that property of stationarity in advance, then taking the differential measure. Uh, often brings you closer to that state. Okay, so here is the change in GDP, uh, and here is the change in consumption and the change in investment. Okay, and so these are the things that we're going to be regressing. Okay, so uh, now that one has understood the data, uh, Stats Models makes it very straightforward to, to do the fitting and construct the model. So we do that, uh, and then here I've just uh, as an example of, of how it works, done forecasting with the, the autoregressive fit. And so, oh, so here is a slightly nicer routine that shows you how, based on all the previous data, it's performed uh, some autoregression and then has plotted uh, for four quarters in advance, so a year in advance, uh, the values, uh, the regressed values for the time series and two sigma plus and minus error bars. Okay, so that was very quick, but we are running out of time, so I won't, I won't talk in more detail uh, about that. But I did, yeah, I did want to mention, if you look up this, this gentleman, um, last year's Nobel Prize in Economics um, was awarded for the use of uh, vector order regressive processes on macroeconomic data, uh, and so obviously it's more than what we just did. Uh, <laughs> And Sargent and Sims, who, who were awarded the prize, did great work. So, yes, so these sorts of things, nevertheless, are, are very relevant in, uh, in econometric research, or were in the 1970s. <laughs> I joke, I joke, I joke. It's true, it's relevant now, it's relevant now. Okay, <laughs> all right, so that was, that was all I wanted to go through in stats models, and it's good because I'm out of time. And my last slide is to remind me to editorialise about the differences between these two. I put verses in quotes because I don't think they are in, in opposition. Um, but when I uh, come to approaching these two packages, I see stats models as being quite frequentist in, in flavour and PyMC as being much more Bayesian. So I hope that uh, in a few weeks' time, maybe about a month, we will actually talk about PyMC in more detail and can go, uh, go into more detail about it, uh, those sorts of things then. Okay, and so the last thing I have to do uh, is put up the homework and tell you what that is, uh, unless uh, there are questions about uh, anything. Or if there are, I'll go through the homework first, and then if you have questions about stats models or other things, uh, please ask. Okay, so this week's homework uh, is it's in four steps. Uh, step one, download this file. So if you have problems with that, ask this gentleman. Uh, so that step is not the challenging one. <laughs> step two... <laughs> I should tell you what is in these images, oh, what is in this file. So this file contains a bunch of images and uh, the images are grouped in classes, as you'll see. And you are going to perform, you're going to build a random forest classifier that operates on these images. Okay, and then we are, after you have done that, we are going to give you a te uh, an actual testing set and you're going to see how your random forest classifier is performed. Okay, so there's a validation set. So you should make your testing set yourself. Yes, sorry. My, my nomenclature, yes. Gonna, you should... We have retained 30% of the images to then test your submission. 
Thank you. Yes, this is a very important point. Don't, don't train on all of the data you download because then you'll overfit. Select a portion of the data that you download, train on that, and then test on the residual, and then we have a validation set that we will provide. Okay, so the way this should be done is first, for the images, design a set of features. So this is using uh, what Stefan taught us uh, earlier today. You have to think of these features yourself. Many of them could be uh, quite rudimentary, like array size, average of the red channel colors, but you should also have some more uh, interesting ones in mind. So uh, Stefan uh, gave good examples of, of things that, that you could use. Once you have uh, assigned features to each of the images, build a random forest classifier uh, within scikit-learn and uh, produce metrics of the estimated error rate using cross-validation. And so you should be able to quantify how much better it is with your random forest than just guessing. And also you should be able to say something about the features that you've chosen. For instance, uh, you might find that some of the features you picked are useless and others are very, very uh, important. And you could iterate between the feature selection and the random forest building. So once you've, you've done that, uh, make sure that your classifier can run on different images uh, in the following format. And then we have validation images. And here's the most important thing. The, we have a validation set. The best classifier that is submitted will get a perfect score and that person can have uh, one previous homework score bumped up half the distance between what they got and a perfect score. So that is, that is an incentive. Again, in a system based on meritocracy and competition, that is an incentive. Sorry? Uh, Yeah. If you've got previous, if you've got, if if your scores have been perfect so far, and you get this one perfectly, maybe. Uh, oh, here we go. Good luck. Yes. <laughs> that. That is. Uh, yeah. That is. I think one of the images. I. I. I'm not sure what is. This is a picture of the U.S. economy or something like that. I, okay. <laughs> 